You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Lisa Gardner. The Renegade Star Series, books one through three by J.N. Cheney. Jace Hughes is a renegade. That means taking almost any job that comes his way, no matter the situation. So long as he can keep his ship floating, he's free to live the life he wants. But that all changes when he meets Abigail Pryor, a nun looking for safe passage out of the system. Too bad there's something off about the cargo she's carrying. Jace knows he shouldn't ask too many questions, but when odd sounds start coming from inside the large metal box, he can't help but check it out. Big mistake. The Renegade Star box set includes the first three books in the series, 900 plus pages, 300 five-star reviews and counting. Find out why people are so intrigued by this thrilling science fiction epic. You won't believe the twists and turns this series takes, or the secrets that get revealed. The Renegade Star Series by J.N. Cheney. I'd also like to tell you about my friend Crystal Pico Watanabe of Pico's House. The Pico's House website now has a new look. Visit Crystal and her team of eight people who help her provide services to fiction authors. Crystal's full slate of services now include beta reading, manuscript critique, developmental editing, line editing, copy editing, and proofreading. Authors, you can also inquire about putting your books in her Book Lover's Box, which is a monthly digital subscription box with a different theme each month. This is free for authors for a limited time. PicosHouse.com for all your book publishing needs. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Lisa Gardner on the show with me today. She has a fantastic new book called Never Tell, and you guys are absolutely going to love this book. Uh, it's one of the most anticipated thrillers of 2019, and uh, it, it, the book lives up to its uh, uh, to the hype. Uh, welcome to the show, Lisa. Thank you very much, Hank. Well, Lisa, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, Ooh. what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, my gosh. It's so funny. Um, when I was six years old, I remember sitting down and thinking, I'm going to write a book. And um, I cut paper into these tiny, tiny little pages, which was very smart of me because it only took like three words to fill a page. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And, and, and clearly this was shortly after Wizard of Oz because I remember flying monkeys and witches on broomsticks. So the originality needed to, to be worked on. <laughs> but, but we all yeah, wear our, our influences on our sleeves at <laughs> <in> the beginning. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's fantastic! Did uh, uh, did were there any adults um, that that saw you doing this and and recognized that uh, maybe maybe Lisa's onto something? Maybe she she's going to be one of those people. Well, my parents like to joke. I mean, they're both accountants. Most of my family are math majors um, and coaches. I mean, we kind of say. Um, a lot of my family reads, but no writers at all. So it's kind of, I definitely was a little bit of the black sheep in the family. My mom does say from, again, a very early age, several of my teachers commented that I was a, a clearly a gifted writer and uh, she should encourage journal writing. Though, to be honest, I actually don't have a memory of that. I just know I was always writing and uh i was kind of the quirky member of the family <laughs> i love that well as a fellow quirky member of the family we we have to stay together yes yeah exactly <laughs> so were you uh were you an avid reader absolutely um and gosh uh love love stephen king uh john saul uh, Rebecca de Maurier. I mean, it was like Daphne de Maurier. Sorry. It's like anything with, you know, a dark and stormy night. And you should be in fear for your life. I mean, I just love that stuff. 
What do you think it was in the beginning that drew you to those types of stories? And and I love to ask people about their early influences because the things uh, inevitably that we love early on seem to, to resurface. They, they're these common themes that come back uh, in the stories that we tell. Um, what, do, what do you think it is or, or was about those kinds of stories that really just lit up your imagination? Well, you know, it's fascinating to me because to this day, I cannot watch a scary movie. You're never going to find me in a haunted house. But I've always gravitated to books that, you know, were were scary, uh, especially uh, the Stephen King and the John Saul. Boy, John Saul, what is it? Suffer the Little Children. Like every book opened with something gruesome and horrible. And it's like, I couldn't get enough of it. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Almost as as scary as a Yeah. (laughs) And I definitely like puzzles. And I will say I get this from my family. Uh, We do love card game strategy puzzles. um, And so, you know, trying to I was definitely that reader who's trying to be the armchair detective. Could I solve the book first? And and yet, you know, of course, you always love the books where you didn't see the ending coming. Exactly. You know, I'm I'm the same way in that. I I don't like visual um uh gruesomeness uh I, I don't really care for horror movies and, and, you know, the splatter and, and all of that stuff, but, uh, there's something about reading it and, and being able to use my own imagination to paint the picture that, that's a completely different experience for me. I, I uh, I, yeah. I know exactly what you're saying there. It's, um, th- when, uh, you a lot of us know that we want to be writers and there's these early um experiences that we have like you had um but rarely does someone take that desire and just follow it straight through and just immediately become uh, a writer and get published and all of that immediately when they're an adult a lot of us take a circuitous route and uh <laughs> come back to writing after doing some other things what what did you think that you uh were going to do with your life you know, as a, a suspense novelist, I am pretty unique. I wrote my first book when I was 17 and sold it at 20. Wow. Um, and I can't even tell you why. <laughs> I think I grew up in a small town in Oregon. I had never met another author, editor. You know, New York Publishing is a million miles away. I think in its own weird way that helped. There was no one to tell me it was hard. There was no one to tell me writing a book is weird or unusual. Um, I was already like we established the quirky member of my family. So having been reading and writing and reading and writing one day, it was just, I'm going to write a book. And it just never occurred to me not to. And my family just kind of like, yep, she's the weird one. <laughs> so I, I did. I spent a summer writing a book and uh, there's a beginning, a middle, the end. And I tell people that's all you need to be a novelist. If you can write a beginning, a middle, and end. And then later I found a guide to getting published. And I was like, well, I have this manuscript. I should do something with it. So I followed the instructions. I found, identified, you know, a suspense publisher in New York. I got the acquisitions editor and submit three chapters. And it, you know, a mere three years later. <laughs> <laughs> you were an overnight success. <laughs> you know, there you go. Yeah. The book was old. And I was very lucky. This was 25 years ago where publishers were really still expecting to work with an author. So I did so much rewriting and it was, you know, intimidating and overwhelming at the time. But I still feel fortunate to this day that, you know, the editor took the risk. She right. saw the potential and she worked with me on, you know, learning the craft. That is such a fantastic story. I, I love the idea um, that you you did it because you didn't know not to do it. Um, and, exactly. And with, with the Internet and all the resources we have now, and there, there's more information uh, than we can shake a stick at and and more we we hear more and more people's stories of of how they succeeded but we also hear a lot of the stories of of the people that didn't succeed and and the 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 you know the hundred times someone tried and failed and uh yeah. and you didn't have the the benefit or the um uh or or the detriment of having that information that's fantastic i 
I still remember attending my first writer's conference after I had sold a book because after the fact, it was like, oh, wait, I'm an author. I should, you know, learn the business. I should understand <laughs> what the hell it is I'm doing here. And sitting through all these panels, with, like you said, filled with horror stories and all the reasons no one will ever sell again and the collapsing mid list and the you know, demise of bookstores and none of us will ever sell again. And just kind of sitting there going, I had no idea this industry was so tragic. (laughs) (laughs) So I had a good takeaway from that conference. And to this day now, when I go and I speak, I always talk about all the reasons you should write and all the reasons you will prevail because it's just too depressing to think of the other way. I mean, writing is something, if you really want to do it, Sit down and do it. You know, why not? If a 17-year-old kid from Oregon can pull this off, there is hope for us all. Right, right. Well, and I love that you said that uh, you were uh, doing this 25 years ago and the same fears and the same uh, nation sure. was going on then, you know, because now it's, well, ebooks have killed uh, and, and Amazon have killed the, the bookstore industry. And now it's going to be audio books and, and no one's going to buy print books anymore. And the fact is, if you tell a compelling story, there's always people out there that want to read a compelling story. You know, it's so funny to me, for the entire time I've been in this industry, it's been like on the brink of demise. And, you know, books have been around now since 1400 and something. It's like, I really don't think they're going anyplace. I think people need a story. I think it's actually up there with, you know, food and water, and we will always be looking for it. And the mediums might change, but a great storyteller with something to say, I mean, Go for it. You you really should. Right, right. Um, what what uh, what kind of story was that first book that you wrote? Was it uh, was it a a thriller like you write now? Or have, what did you begin with? So I started with romantic suspense. So it was definitely still a murder. I've always. I've always gravitated to those books. Um, so it was a woman who ran a shelter for homeless teenagers and the streets of Portland, Oregon, witnesses a murder at night, and, of course, the detective that must keep her safe. Uh, in the beginning, I definitely had more books that focused on a relationship with suspense. And then <laughs> you'll laugh. This is when I found myself as a writer. You know, 10 years later, I was still writing these books and publishing them, but they were very small. They were genre fiction. I joke my mother has them in a warehouse, but otherwise you can't find them. And I joined the real world and I got a real job because I had to pay bills. But the more I was a business consultant, the more I was like, what I love is writing. And surely there has got to be a way to make that my career. So by then I'd met some other authors and authors are incredibly supportive of one another. And they, their advice was, you need to get an agent. You need to take this seriously. So they actually took me to New York. I submitted the books I had published to an agent. And then in the turning point of my career, she called me up and she's like, I'd love to represent you, but this is my advice. Your romance is only okay in these books. But your violence is exceptional. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could take that so one of like, a couple of different ways. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And actually, really, what you said was your sex, sex is so so. Your violence is just like, oh, you know, things your family just never tells you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> so, it was her recommendation that I write a, you know, standalone thriller. This is, you know, in the days of Silence of the Lambs, you know, yeah. over the top, serial killer, everyone dies. And gosh, especially back 25 years ago, you submitted to New York and they were like, yes, more gruesome, more gruesome. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I wrote The Perfect Husband, a book about a serial killer who escapes from prison, his reign of terror against everyone who put him there, his wife, ex-wife who knows he's coming for her and her determination to keep herself and her daughter safe and um it was a debut thriller and came within two slots of the new york times list wow so yeah that, that's pretty I quit incredible. my day job and i've never looked back <laughs> so what, what was that feeling like when when you took this this advice um and 
kind of course corrected a little bit. It sounds like you were, yeah. you were already on course. You just needed to adjust a little bit. Um, when, when you realized that and you began writing the book that became this breakout success, um, did it feel different to you? Did the, the writing of that book and the kind of new direction, uh, and, uh, and the, the new encouragement that you got, did it make you feel different as a writer? Well, what it was was taking that leap of faith and confidence. I felt I couldn't write suspense because even then, as it is now, you know, we use this term a lot, authentic fiction. If you're going to write a crime novel, your crime can be fictional, but the police procedure needs to be real. And I didn't know any cops. I didn't have a Rolodex, so to speak. I just felt like that world was beyond me. And to write this first thriller, it's like, okay, I, I am going to have to learn how to do this. And I discovered anyone, by virtue of being a taxpayer, you can call your local law enforcement police department and ask permission to interview. And over time, I've learned, you know, the real, the magic words are, you know, I'm a fiction writer. I have a fictional crime. Could you please help me, you know, have the best procedure possible? I want to show the truth behind what you do and be as accurate as possible. And whether it's, you know, visiting the FBI Academy or going to the body farm, these are people who love their work and they're happy to talk about it as long as you're not, as long as you're using it, you know, appropriately and with respect. And that's now my favorite part of my job is doing the research and getting to talk to real people who have very, very cool jobs <laughs> and bring those worlds to life for the reader. Because I think that's why we like to read. We want to walk in someone else's shoes. We want to learn cool things about forensics and um, what is it? you know, how to track a fugitive. And it really is a crazy amount of fun. And, and from that perspective, it's like, yeah, this is what I want to do with my life. <laughs> well, I've, I've found that in uh, it, not just with um, with talking with with police officers and law enforcement, but just about anyone. If you if you show respect yeah. and that and and convey that you really want to portray them well and uh, most everybody is willing to talk about what they do. Everybody wants to be represented well. It's always interesting to me because, you know, Never Tell is about, you know, fictional people and a fictional detective, and I spend all my time alone with fictional voices in my head. But you could not do this job if you didn't just truly like people because it's really a human story you're trying to tell. And some of the things have just been extraordinary. I remember wanting to learn about evidence recovery teams for the FBI and getting permission to interview this woman who actually had worked the um, Pentagon after 9-11, that crime scene. And gosh, a year later, and I mean, this is in the FBI, what they call an extracurricular. This is, you know, work you're doing in addition to your bureau hours. And I mean, they were at, you know, the Pentagon for months sifting through that debris. She's like the most significant find she discovered was a wedding ring and just how powerful it was to at least be able to return that to a family. So they had that much of their loved one. But then when the book came out and I contacted her to send her a signed copy, um, she had left the bureau and she was dying of cancer that she probably contracted working the Pentagon. I mean, it's that kind of sacrifice, that kind of call to service. And she wasn't bitter about it. She was sad, but she's like, you know, this is my life work and this is what I chose to do. And unfortunately, you know, that those scenes were so toxic. But there are extraordinary people out there. I mean, there are just extraordinary people out there doing extraordinary work. Right. Well, and the uh, uh, you know, one of the characters in this book doing extraordinary work is Dee Dee Warren, your recurring character um, that you've written about before. Where did Dee Dee come from, and why does this character resonate so deeply with you? You know, Dee Dee is just plain fun. Uh, she was originally meant as a walk-on part 
and doing research for a sniper novel I was working on. I had a crime scene where the state police were like, well, actually, that would be Boston jurisdiction. So even though my main character was a state uh, policeman, I couldn't use him for the scene. So I created Dee Dee just for a few chapters. I thought I made her fun, you know, these killer pair of boots, you know, the shirt that said felonious on it, gave her all this attitude. Cause I just thought, you know, you needed that to kind of pep up the scene. And it was amazing. The immediate reader response to her. She's just so, um, she has so much attitude. She says all that stuff that most of us, you know, we're just too polite to say <laughs> she is so confident and determined and just loves her job. I mean, to me, she's that unapologetic workaholic and you like being around people who know what they want and are great at what they do and are having the time of their life. I mean, there's just no place she'd rather be than a crime scene <laughs> and, <laughs> and that kind of gusto. I mean, readers love it and she's a little brash sometimes and she can be harsh because she's going to get results, but right. you like her for it. <laughs> right. And then we have Flora Dane. Uh, tell me about Flora. So Flora is like kind of almost the other half of the law enforcement coin. Uh, she has come by justice in a very different route. As a college student, she was kidnapped. She was held for over a year. Uh, she did survive, but there's no going back to normal. And she's a very powerful mix where on the one hand, she's vulnerable. She's damaged, but she's also determined never to be a victim again. And to that end, she's gone a bit extreme now. She knows everything about self-defense. She can kill you with a straw. She is actively pursuing predators. She's not waiting for the world to get safer. She is going to make it safer and she has to kill off, you know, every rapist one at a time. <laughs> and that's actually how she and Dee Dee meet. And right. Dee Dee's not sure what to do with her because on the one hand it's always self-defense or it's smart but on the other hand you, you know door uh, Didi knows this is a woman pushing the envelope and so she makes her her confidential informant partly because Flora is very good, but kind of trying to keep her on a leash a little. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, readers have had fun with this. It's kind of like, are you Team Dee or Team Flora? If you want justice, do you go by the book or do you just track them down and make them pay? <laughs> or, or do you hope it's some uh, combination of the two? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, I like so, that Flora... No, she's not quite sane, but this is who she is right now, so there. <laughs> right, exactly. Like, this is this is what we have to work with, so this is what you get. Yeah, um, yeah. Your your newest book, Never Tell, uh, by the way, it's available everywhere uh, now. It's uh, in, in hardcover, audiobook, Kindle, however you consume books, it's available now. There are links to it in the show notes <laughs> like of the that. show. Um, but the... Uh, we open with a really intriguing scenario. Um, so we've got um, a, a woman who is standing over her husband. He's been shot several times uh, or he's been shot, but his computer is, is riddled with bullet holes that immediately evokes all sorts of images and um, and possibilities. Um, where did this yeah. idea for this plot come from for you? Oh, let's face it. Aren't there days you have you wanted to kill your computer? Because I know I <laughs> <laughs> just this morning. I like, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I don't plan my novels. Um, I come up with a premise and and I kind of add on to it questions that I don't even know the answer uh, for. And I, I love the concept of this couple. And you know, Evie's pregnant. Um, you know, they've been working together to fix up this house. You know, at one point they loved each other and you know, things have gone wrong, that there's definitely trouble in paradise. When she first you know, pulls into the driveway, returning home, she is filled with dread. Uh, you know, something is wrong. She doesn't know what's wrong, but her marriage is definitely going south. And then the crime scene and just her immediate response is, 
to shoot the computer. And I didn't know why. We didn't know why. But I think it's kind of that visceral thing where my world is about to collapse and I need to, to protect. But the question is, who was she protecting? Uh, her, her husband, herself? She's pregnant. The legacy for her unborn child. Um, I don't know that she can answer the question just yet. But I think that kind of immediate visceral response of, you know, I am in so much trouble now. Uh, what's the first thing I can do to kind of hide? Right. You, you said you don't plan your novels, but you begin with a premise. Um, when you yeah. when that when that premise begins to coalesce and you start thinking about the possibilities that could come out of that premise. Yeah. Um, uh, do you begin by just kind of uh, writing on the page and exploring that scene? And, and then like, at, at what point do you feel like that you have uh, what the story is going to be? So I always start with a puzzle. So we're having a pregnant woman standing over her husband's dead body. And we know 16 years earlier, like there's this immediate sense of deja vu for her. Uh, she accidentally shot and killed her father. So she's kind of struggling with this also this notion of, oh, good God, it's happening again. Then I go to the police and I start talking to them because, again, authentic fiction. I need real world procedure. Um, and actually, detectives are fabulous. They help me. Um, shoot the husband better if that makes even more sense i mean like you know you know exactly what kind of details do we need to account for what kinds of things would you be investigating um she would definitely be taken in custody for the night uh what is that like for someone who you know grew up with money in cambridge and is pregnant so she's concerned about her unborn child to find herself thrown in jail overnight uh, so i got to visit the jail um you know, as you, the law enforcement process itself starts giving me major scenes I need, I know that need to happen. And then when you start thinking about, again, these questions of what would this be like for the character? I mean, poor Evie, pregnant, you know, in these freezing cold jail cells, it just starts to play out. And you, I always talk about it, it's a like boot camp. It's like I do the worst possible things to poor Evie and Flora and Dee Dee, and you, then you watch their character evolve. And there is this magic moment, as weird as it sounds, where, I don't know, everyone finds themselves and we're just kind of off and running. And off and running we are. Um, this is one of the <laughs> best best puzzle thrillers I, I love that that you use the word puzzle a lot because um yeah because that that is we're we're we're, we're trying to solve this riddle and uh and you've you've included layer upon layer of of deceit and all of this stuff that that as i keep turning the pages i'm like man she is just taking me deeper and deeper into this thing um do you when you finish your first draft, uh, do you go back and, and, and look at ways that you could add more tension? Um, like in the revision process, how much, uh, story manipulation goes in at that point? So I am a huge rewriter. It's, I never know what to think of that. Sometimes you think, you know, 25 years later, why can't I get this right the first time? <laughs> and I am so <laughs> envious of authors that do. But we talk about process. And my process is, you know, in the words of Anne Lamott, you know, the shitty first draft. Cause exactly. I don't know what I'm doing. But once you get all the pieces there, then going back and much more methodically, scientifically, cleaning it all up clarifying it it's often interesting to me that you know you can have four pages and you're like actually all i needed were those four words and that to me is where things get tight and i want it to be a page turner i don't want you to be bogged down in extra extraneous detail i want you to be flying through these pages desperate for what's going to happen next Right. Well, and sometimes getting to the end of it at the end of that first draft is when you can stand back and, and put on your story architect hat and say, OK, now yeah. I see the big thing. Now let me go in. And, and that's where that's where the real magic happens, I think. Well, and I'm actually one of those people that there's generally, you know, 
uh, some fluff that needs to go, but there's always details I also need to add. Uh, like, you know, at a certain point, I'm like, you know, none of my characters are wearing clothes. Probably <laughs> they were wearing something. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, we don't need to be spending too much time on it, but like a sentence or two of, <laughs> you know, <laughs> What does this person look like? What is this? Uh, I'm kind of action oriented when I'm writing the first time. And when you go back through, I always, you know, talk about it's almost like the, the Goldilocks things. There's, there's like, it, there's like too many details, too few details. And then the third time it's just right. right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, Lisa, I know you've got to get uh, onto uh, another interview right now. The book Never Tell is out available everywhere now. There's links to it. Um, if people are just uh, learning about you and your work, is there a place they can connect with you online to learn more about you and dig into your back catalog? Absolutely. You can check out the whole writing library at lisagardner.com. If you like social media, you're welcome to follow me. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram at Lisa Gardner BKS, Lisa Gardner Books. And um, we have a great book tree now, so you can see how all, everything connects and read about the characters. And um, oh, I have a very funny video on the website, A Day in the Life. And you can see uh, <laughs> just how suspense authors, you know, uh, kill time <laughs> or get to a day. <laughs> Right. And and Gardner is like my name, Garner, but with a D in the middle. Uh, Lisa, it's been so much fun talking to you. Uh, thank you for taking time to come on the show. Oh, thank you so much, Hank. Missing Wings by Andrea Lumen. Born with an ability the Villa D people of Madar believe make her one of the first to be blessed by God, Katrina's destiny unravels when her father is poisoned and her mother steals her into the human world to hide among those who hate her kind. In a near-fatal attempt to return home, Katrina is stripped of her wings. The poison meant to kill her father leaves him in a degenerative state. When her eldest brother discovers she has survived, he orders her to stay in hiding. She must wait, concealed in the human world, until the danger of their father's uncontrolled rages is contained. Grown and adapted to the human world, Katrina encounters one of her kind. The promise of home and the first love leads her into a situation capable of starting war among the Villadine. Will a human upbringing, mistakes, and the loss of her abilities bar her from reclaiming her heritage? Will unraveling the mystery of her mother's betrayal lead her family into an even greater danger? Missing Wings by Andrea Lumen. The Locust, books 1-3 to three by Ralph Kern. The Complete Locust series, an epic tale of mystery, survival, exploration, intrigue, and war. The cruise ship MS Atlantica is lost. On these strange and uncharted seas where even the compass shows the sun rising to the west, Atlantica's passengers and crew must do what it takes to survive. And unfathomed, Atlantica arrives in a strange new world. Unable to locate land with no way to contact home, they must find new allies, fend off relentless enemies, and discover the horrifying truth behind the Locust. The future of humanity will be decided as the fleet confronts the architect of the Locust. Not everyone will survive the desperate final battle. The Locust box set contains all three action-packed novels in this best-selling science fiction thriller series, Unfathomed, Expedition, and Osiris. Acclaim for great characters, thrilling action, technical accuracy, and a compelling sense of mystery. Buy it today! The Complete Locust series by Ralph Kern. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. I was ten years old when I saw my first ghost. The year was 1770. My father was a barber. He kept a small shop at the Kuenhoven Inn, where the King's Road met the Old Loop. Our modest home lay to the north between the inn and the hanging tree. A simple box of pine boards, whitewashed with crushed oyster shell, one room with a spinning wheel for mother, a chair for father, and up a ladder of branches, a garret where my parents slept. I slept on the floor below, alongside my little brother, Hans, five years younger than I. Our floor sloped toward the Hudson, so that when Hans rolled over in his sleep, he often went on rolling and couldn't stop, collecting splinters and grievances. Yet on this particular night, he slept peacefully, and I was the fitful one. 
A mouse had taken shelter in our wall, fleeing the October chill. It scritched and scratched, nibbling a nest for itself. The sound thrilled me. I possessed a vivid mind, full of toadstools and bullfrogs and lightning storms, and so imagined a skeleton writhed in the wood. The bones of Anne Underhill, perhaps, murdered by Indians at Spook Rock. I'd heard that tale from my father, who reveled in the Dutch superstitions. He would gather us to fireside on winter nights and spin tales of the Heer of Dunderberg, that storm king who rattled our white windows, of the Lady of Raven Rock who died in snowfall, pining for her lover, of trolls beneath the penny bridge and hobgoblins in the hanging tree. He'd filled my head with such dark romance that I lay waiting for Anne's little finger bones to drag me off to some bloody fate. I rather hoped she would. A cloud cleared the moon, and a square of light fell on my mother's spinning wheel. The sharp spindle glinted, and the wheel began to turn, without touch. A figure appeared before me, as through a mist, a gray head bent to the work. She fixed me with eyes black as open graves and whispered in a low, guttural hiss, Spin, or you shall not eat. I cried out and fell to my pallet, arms over my head. Hans awoke, lost his balance, and rolled away, bleeding with pain as he struck the riverside wall. Father emerged above. Agatha, what is wrong? There's a ghost, Papa. A ghost, help me. Hans laughed despite his bruises, and Mother moaned and ordered us to sleep. But Papa descended and took my hands, his blue eyes twinkling. What did you see? An old woman. She said, spin or you shall not eat. Oh, he raised a candle beneath his chin. You saw old Willow. She lived here long ago, when this was the home of Isaac Hart, our candle maker. Her husband was killed by savages. Hart took her in at the request of Lord Phillips, who paid a token sum for her upkeep. But Hart was greedy and kept the money for himself. He never fed her unless she spun. So Willow spun and spun and spun like a spider, year by year, growing old and blind and falling to waste. She died at that spinning wheel, fell over one day, and the spindle pierced her heart. Hans screamed and hid beneath the table. Mother appeared above. Daniel Van Ripper, you are a fool. I kissed Papa's fingers, for I loathed that spinning wheel. I'd be no toothless ghost, spinning and haunting little girls. I felt pity for such a spirit and gratitude to have her example before me, stealing my resolve. Every night thereafter, I would leave a crust of bread for old Willow and sleep with one eye open in case she came to spin for me again.